Hi, everyone. How are we doing? OK, firstly, just to apologize, there should be some cool hexagons uh, behind this. You can't see that. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> OK, well, but thank you so much for giving up your Saturday to come and listen to me drone on about uh, UI UX. Hopefully, it'll be good. Uh, so just to introduce myself, for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, my name's Andy. Uh, I work at Avenard. Um, I think most people who know me would describe me as a bit of a UI and UX enthusiast. And uh, if you like this sort of thing, um, I have a blog at uh, datadatastuff.co.uk, which was initially quite funny. It becomes less funny every time I have to spell it out. Uh, so <laughs> this is um, it's going to be. Uh, this talk is kind of uh, aimed at uh, sort of a bit introductory, so we're going to kind of cover off the basics. Uh, but there is going to be quite a lot, so uh, let's just jump straight in. So just to make sure we're all kind of thinking about the same thing, we'll just quickly define things. So uh, when we think about user experience, uh, what that basically means is just the overall experience of somebody using your product. Uh, so like for Amazon, for example, uh, you know, it's, it's from when you decide you want to buy something all the way through to when you do. That's the whole experience. Then the user interface is how you interact with the product. Um, so like in Power BI, that would be our Power BI reports, of course. And then in, uh, when we're thinking about data products, we have visualizations, which are just uh, you know, uh, data which has been visualized to make it easy to understand. So I know quite a lot of Power BI people who are maybe not that interested in the UI and UX side. You know, it's all about the numbers. And you do have to get the numbers right, of course. But um, there's a, a study by House and Salam that um, basically BI is only adopted by about 30% of employees um, in, in what they surveyed. And you know, the numbers seem super low to me because we take a list of what the client wants, we build exactly what they ask for, and then they don't use it. And you're just like, well, why? Um, and so a second study, um, again by Housen, uh, kind of drilled into that. And basically, the main challenges are all around it being difficult to use, people not knowing how to use it or not being able to get the answers they want. Uh, this little chart on the left, hopefully you can see it. But uh, in organizations where the tools are rated as very easy to use, there's a 35% adoption rate of the companies surveyed. Uh, but when it was very difficult to use, it was only 27%. Um, so I mean, yeah, basically, this is why you should care about UI and UX. Because if a product's not easy to use, and you're not going to give people the answers that they need uh, when they need them, then people just won't use it. Um, and you know, in Power BI, that means they're going back to their spreadsheets. And uh, <laughs> it's just a waste of time. So um, for anyone who saw Rishi's talk yesterday uh, on storytelling and data, you'll know uh, he, he mentioned cognitive load. Um, now, data visualization is all about reducing cognitive load. Um, that's actually what a visualization is. Because we could write out all the numbers in a big uh, thing of text, but then you have to read it. It's very slow. You can just glance at a chart. Um, so when we're designing our products, um, to make sure that the cognitive load is as low as possible, basically, is what we're aiming for. You want things to be really easy to understand. Um, so our brains are amazing, and they're constantly trying to find patterns and identify things. Um, but it's also quite energy intensive, so we're quite lazy. So we need to just make sure that things are as easy to understand as possible. So we're going to look at a few different things that can influence this cognitive load. Um, so uh, obviously, bad design will increase it, make things harder to use. Good design can help us reduce this. So the first thing to think about is mental models. So in our lives, we build models about how we interact with the world. Um, an example here, you've probably seen the thing on the left. Every day of your life is a web browser. Uh, the back button is nearly always on the left. And if you were to use a browser where for some reason they decided to swap them around, you're going to be really annoyed because you're going to be pushing forward quite a lot of the time. Um, and that's because you have a mental model about where that button should be. Um, it's kind of like with driving. When you first start driving, you know, it's quite complicated. You have to think about everything. And then once you've been driving for a few years, you forget the entire journey that you just drove. It's so automatic. Um, so when we're designing BI, what we really want to do is make sure that we're designing uh, to kind of synchronize with people's existing mental models as, as closely as possible, um, which is why designing based on websites is often quite a good idea. Um, so these are just some fun ones. Uh, so obviously, you need to keep the effort down. So um, this is from uh, viz.wtf, which is very fun. You should check it out. Um, I don't really have time to go into them too much. But if you kind of produce these crazy things, so like the one on the left is basically unreadable. Um, I've tried to read it. I still don't understand what it's saying. Um, and then the one on the right is kind of good, but there's so many call outs, it just kind of everything gets lost in the noise. Um, and I once worked somewhere where their mantra was execs don't click. Um, and I think that's actually quite good to think about. So uh, when people are coming into your tools, they just want answers. They don't want to like dig around and have to think about it for ages or try and figure out what on earth that thing is. Uh, they just want their answers. So keeping that effort required as, as low as possible is great. 
Um, so the next thing to consider as well is complexity. So these two charts show the same data, but one of them is grouped by month, one of them is grouped by day. Um, and I'm not saying that you should never have complex visuals because, of course, you know, sometimes things are complicated. There's no way around it. Um, but what I am saying is you probably never want to lead with the most complex visual, right? So start off with it rolled up to months where you can kind of see the nice patterns. It's quite easy to understand. And then um, I just clipped that out of Power BI, but obviously you can drill down. So we should always start at the highest possible, easiest to understand level, and then just drill down to more complex if you need it. But if your question is answered by the first simpler chart, then job done. Um, so this is a huge topic. <laughs> I really don't have time to cover all of this. Uh, but so color is super important. Uh, it's very psychologically powerful, and there's a lot of unconscious associations we have with colors. Um, and as you can see from this, I'm not going to go through all of them, obviously, but a really interesting one is uh, the color blue tends to kind of uh, evoke like feelings of sort of trust or strength or dependability. And that's why nearly all banks uh, have blue logos, and uh, so does Facebook, because they want you to trust them. They're trying to engender that and, you know, don't worry about what we're doing with your data. Um, and you can see, I, I don't have time to go through all of them, but it's really interesting. If you start looking at the colors of logos and thinking what those companies are trying to say to you with that, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, so when we design for BI, oh, these colors have gone a bit funny. So sorry about that. It looks better on this laptop, but <laughs> it's quite a small screen, so we'll stick with this. Um, so when we're designing color schemes, quite often you might work for a client that already has a palette, obviously, in which case just use that, it's fine. Uh, but also quite a lot of the time you have where they have sort of a main color and then you have to produce the rest of the palette. So when we're thinking about that, um, you could just pick colors randomly, but they probably won't look too good together. Um, so using color theory, um, there's this color wheel idea. Uh, and there's, if we pick colors carefully, then they'll complement each other better. So picking colors from opposite sides of the wheel, that's our complementary one there. Uh, you know, they, they generally produce pretty nice color schemes. My living room is blue and yellow, it's quite good. Um, and th there's others, it gets more and more complicated as you go down. Um, but just a free take home, if you haven't used Palaton before, palaton.com, uh, it does this for you, so you just feed it a color, tell it what kind of pattern you want, it'll generate it all for you. Um, and another really important thing to remember when we're thinking about color is just check um, colorblind friendliness, um, which Palaton has a little filter that will let you do that, um, just to make sure it's as accessible as possible. Um, also, instant eyedropper is a really good tool uh, to just pick, pick colors out. Um, and so quite often when I'm designing a palette, what I like to do is go to the company's website, just see what kind of colors they're using, pick those out, um, and then try and mash them into something that folds into color theory. Um, but you do also need to consider your audience, right? So in the, in the West, uh, we see red generally as like a warning color. Um, and in other cultures, uh, maybe it's not so much, so hopefully no one's going to correct me on this, but according to the internet, uh, the symbol on the right is uh, for lucky, uh, like luck in finance, and so red is kind of considered like a lucky color. So it's just something to think about. Um, you know, when we're thinking about these associations, not everyone is going to have the same associations as us, so it's really important to think about the people uh, that we're, we're going to be showing this to. And then the last little bit to look through, um, so these are some studies by Nielsen in 2006. Um, they're basically eye tracking experiments. So they ask people to read things or search for information, and then they just track how, how people look. So the standard looking pattern uh, is, is the F pattern uh, or the Z pattern. And basically, uh, in Western cultures where we read from left to right, people start in the top left corner, move along, down, and then along. So uh, going back to those mental models, when we're designing our reports, what you want to be doing if you want to encourage this sort of thing, is to make sure that your headline figures are always at the top left, because that's where people are going to look first. So we kind of give people what they want, and then maybe the more complex stuff, where maybe people aren't going to need it all the time, towards the bottom right corner, which probably will be seen as a bit less important. Um, there's loads of different layer patterns, though. We don't have time to go through them all. But uh, you know, so if people are scanning, that's the layer cake pattern. They're scanning for a specific piece of information. They'll look through text in a different way. If you're reading an article, um, so design actually changes how people will uh, look. So it's just important to bear in mind, when people come into your report, what are they going to look at first? And then where are they going to look at next? And what answers are you trying to give? And that is how you can kind of organize your report optimally. Um, but again, you do have to consider your audience, um, as I touched on before. So uh, in Middle Eastern cultures, uh, like uh, Arabic, for example, you read right to left, uh, the F pattern is inverted. And there's been studies that show that, um, which obviously would make sense. So again, it's just important to bear in mind who it is you're building this for. OK, so uh, ooh, made pretty good time. So uh, now it's time for a little demo. So what I'm going to do, I have an OK report here. 
uh, <laughs> ish. And so what we're going to do is just apply some of those principles. Um, so first of all, let's just take this back button. I only have about six minutes, by the way, so it's not going to be perfect. We're, just, we're going for pretty good here, that's all. So the back button needs to be on the top left, because that's where we'd expect to see it. So let's put that there. Um, we'll just move this out of the way for a sec. Uh, so here, where we have this filter down here, um, so this is layout again, but layout can provide context. So if the filter's underneath this visual, it might sort of imply maybe it just filters this visual. Um, but actually, we'll see if we just uh, use it. Yeah, it, it filters the whole page. So what we're going to do is we'll just take that, and we'll just pop it up here, and just uh, shrink it down a little bit. Uh, and this is kind of like building into this website design, right? So stuff on the top kind of affects everything beneath it. Um, obviously, you can use filter panels and stuff, but sometimes clients want filters on the page. So if you are going to do that, it's just good to make sure they're in a logical place, usually at the top, if they're going to affect everything. Or if they are just going to affect one visual, you should try and pair it off. So um, just the layout can kind of give that little bit of context. Uh, so the next thing is we are saying about the F pattern. So we want to put the headline figures up top uh, to make sure that they're easily. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> oh, dear. Tech problems have struck. What's going on? Oh, no. They're not locked. What's going on? Oh, OK, OK. I don't know what that was. That was just to raise my heart rate a little bit, I think. OK. <laughs> so um, we're going to put these cards up here. Again, I'm not going to line them up properly because I don't, don't really have the time. But uh, so we'll, we'll put them like this. And so because we want our most important figure on the left, so we'll always put the biggest, highest aggregated figure on the left, so our global sales, the most important thing. I should say, by the way, this is uh, video game sales data from pre-2000. It's trying to do the retro game theme. Uh, so we got our global sales on the left. Uh, then the North American market is the second biggest, so we'll put that there. The Japanese is the third biggest and uh, European on the edge there. So already, if our CEO is coming in and uh, he just, just wants some uh, immediate answers, uh, then it's, it's already laid out there. So if he was just coming in to find out you know, how much money have we made in whatever period this report covers, uh, he's got his answer straight away. He's happy. The tool's done his job. Uh, OK, so for the rest of these, so here we have global sales by year. Um, and what you'll notice is it's been sorted by uh, cash value. Uh, but this is kind of going against mental models, because generally when you see a time series, you'd expect it to be organized by time. So we'll just do that. And we'll just also change it to uh, a vertical one, so we can bring it out a little bit. That's a lot better. And uh, what we'll also do is actually organize it so it runs from left to right, because that's what people would expect it to do. Uh, and then so here, again, so thinking about complexity, right? so it's kind of hard to get figures off this chart, because uh, you know, they're, they're quite small. Maybe you can't really see. So a data label would probably be better here. And if we're using data labels, we don't need axes, because it just it's redundant. You know exactly what every point is. Uh, so that looks much better now. Uh, this is just a table, which is kind of boring, so we'll just change that to uh, something like this, and we'll just... Uh, and again, so here, when you start to have really small values, um, obviously it's super hard to see what they're actually saying. So we'll just uh, use the Format Painter, which is a big time saver, uh, which is good in time-pressured demos. OK, good, that worked. I'm quite happy about that. Uh, okay, and the last one. So obviously, no talk about UI or UX would be complete without making fun of pie charts. That is actually contractually obligated. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so obviously, this is terrible. Um, but pie charts actually aren't terrible in of themselves. It's just if you have more than like maybe four or five categories, it, it just becomes pointless. And actually, um, the human brain is really bad at determining the difference between areas, uh, which is why like tree maps kind of suck as well, because we're not that good at looking at two very similarly sized things and saying this one's a little bit bigger, uh, which is why just putting numbers in is, is nearly always going to be better. Um, and of course here, uh, this is showing us um, every single video game made before the year 2000 and how much money it made, uh, which is insane. No one can use this pie chart. All you can tell from this is that Super Mario Bros. did very well. So what we'll do instead is we'll turn it into a bar chart. Um, and so what we have now is because it's sorted um, by the overall revenue produced, um, it actually works pretty good. So uh, you have your, your most important ones at the top. So at a glance, you can just see you know, everybody loves Super Mario Bros. 
Uh, and then if you're interested, you can kind of drill down further. But it means that just at a glance, you kind of have all this. So, sorry, these layouts are really winding me up. Should have, should have done that better. Um, but yeah, OK. So now what we've basically done is let me show you the first one again. Just to, uh, OK, I should have duplicated this page. Just try and remember the bad one. It, it wasn't very good, was it? So uh, <laughs> that's fine. Um, uh, so one thing is when I look at this, it's like, oh, it's a lot of bar charts. It's a bit boring. But that's OK, because um, when we're doing visualizations, uh, what we're trying to do is get information across in the cleanest, quickest way possible. Um, so never pick a chart because it looks cool, because uh, uh, that is just going to increase complexity. Stuff being basic is good. Simple is good. Um, and you can always build out from this. And of course, this would be like your kind of summary page. This might even be too detailed for a CEO overview, to be honest. But with Power BI, obviously, we have features like drill through and stuff like that. So you can always keep your nice, simple, high-level stuff up top, and then just have the more complex stuff kind of hidden uh, so people can drill in if they need to. Um, cool. So now, I think that's pretty much everything. I spoke way faster than I thought I would. Uh, but that's good, because I had quite a lot to say. So if there's any questions, we have a few minutes for those. Yes. <laughs> Very good. I wasn't expecting hecklers. Uh, OK. <laughs> uh, no, that's cool. So um, execs don't click, but um, we don't just build reports for execs. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, execs don't click, but uh, I'm just saying that they might use drill through. <laughs> and uh, it, it is a really good point. Actually, people seem to hate drill through for some reason, uh, which is why the drill through button, people seem to way prefer to right clicking. I don't know why. They just seem to like it. Um, but we don't only build reports for execs. So your super CEO who's super busy, maybe he just needs those headline figures. But the report might also service uh, you know, maybe slightly less senior people who might need to drill in and find those answers for the CEO. right? Uh, so execs don't click, but they do have people who might. Uh, <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi. Sorry, I can't really hear you. <laughs> Yeah, now that's a great question. So the question was, um, what's my view on wireframing, basically? So uh, before we even start jumping into Power BI and stuff, uh, just mapping things out, uh, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think more important than that, though, is workshopping with people to understand exactly what they want in the first place. So before we even start thinking about what to put on the page, uh, we need to drive it by understanding what KPIs we need, what questions we're trying to answer. Um, and so the worst thing you can do is ask someone, what visuals would you like to see? Because the answer will be wrong. They don't want that. Uh, what you need to do is find out the question that they want answered. Uh, and then uh, as experts, it's our job to then uh, put, put that in, in the best form. Um, but yeah, I think, sorry, I didn't really answer your question. But wireframing is good. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. Anybody else? We have time for a couple more. You good? OK, cool. That's good. Um, are there, OK, well, if there's any questions like remotely, you know, um, bang them in. Uh, otherwise, please leave some feedback. Um, you know, I think you can win something if you do, so it's worth it. Um, and otherwise, thank you very much. This is great. Cheers.